Hello, hello. Welcome back to the Story Darlings podcast. I'm Sandra. And I'm Tara. And today we are talking about... What the hell is the name of this book? Today we are talking about the fourth and final book in the Artifacts of Arano series by Nisha J. Tooley. I was trying to figure out what series it was, but the book is called The Tale of the Heart Queen. Uh Uh-huh. And I'm like, is it the Heart Queen saga? Is it what what is this? Like there was a Sun Queen at some point. Yeah. I'm like, (laughs) I forgot what the saga or like book series was called. So I'm glad Sandra remembered that. We started with Trial of the Sun Queen, and then there was Rule of the Aurora King, Back to Fate of the Sun King, which was interesting because that title kind of applies to this book too, with some of the things that happened, right? Uh Uh-huh. And then, as Tara said, Tale of the Heart Queen. This one was a chunker. I will Mm -hmm. say that. There were so many different plot lines, and we got closure, I would say, on all of them, right? And this is a fantasy romance, so you do get that happily ever after for everyone, I feel like. Yeah, yeah. I mean, even the ones that you're like, wait, is it coming? There's a built-in thing in a few stories that just Mm -hmm, come mm -hmm. at the end of this one. Yeah. Yeah. So if you remember from the end of book three, which was Fate of the Sun King, Lore accidentally killed Nadir, right? Or so she thinks, because he doesn't have a heartbeat anymore, right? Which is a way to leave this for months on end for us. I remember getting to that point in the book and I was like, wait, what? Yeah. How are you going to leave us there? But I mean, the good thing was we pick up exactly at that spot and basically Lore is like, over his body trying to make a deal with the goddess Zara to spare him and that's kind of where things kick off with this book so I know when this episode comes out it's going to be release day for Tale of the Heart Queen so chances are you have not read this book yet so if you are listening there's going to be spoilers so you might want to hold off until you read the book but we're just going to go right into it. I may be wrong on this, but we have already found out at the beginning of this book that Zara is not to be trusted, right? We found out her backstory in the last book where she she was the only one who didn't give a shit about her people and that's why they chose her to be a god and she's like been doing very selfish things as the god and things like that. So I wondered to Lore's estimation of Zara when she calls her to help her save Nadir. I'm like, hmm... I feel like this is not going to turn out the way you think it is. <laughs> yeah, Zara was the lazy, the lazy bitch, the lazy queen that didn't help her people. And then they're, they're like, you know what? We're going to tap you to be the new goddess. Okay. And that decision in and of itself was, okay, you're not good enough to control your people on earth. So let's just make you a goddess. Like everybody else is good with their people. So we're going to send them back because their people need them. But you, your people don't need you because you're being a shit leader. <laughs> so let's just make you the only goddess and control everything yeah that sounds yes and the centuries or whatever that have passed have not been kind to zara because bitch is crazy she she basically takes nadir with the intention of not giving him back to lore as she promised if lore goes and gets these artifacts for her right she keeps calling nadir herrick yes yes and herrick we learn the end of this is Nadir's like great 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 grandfather like the first ruler of the Aurora after in the second age he's the one not talked about at Thanksgiving dinner yes he is because he is cray cray too (laughs) um he is the one that we saw previously that was seducing Zara to get his way because he wanted to be the god and so he is trying to kill her to become the god himself and he is using his manly wiles to do that (laughs) so manly (laughs) um he is sleeping with her to get close to her to basically poison her i mean in a way it kind of worked he did Uh get her hooked on that d yeah yeah he did so much so that she kidnaps his great 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 grandson and is trying to marry him so that she can have a a way of keeping that family line in her in her (laughs) oh chuckle chuckle (laughs) i don't know how else to say that but she she is hooked so much that she doesn't care which person carrying his genes i'm blushing she is um she got a she was very rapey and very creepy i felt bad for nadir 
<laughs> well, and we we also find out that he's not the only one that she has done this with. No. Like, she is very rapey to anybody she she finds a fancy in because she's the goddess. Like, why can't she be rapey? Yeah. Then we fast forward over to Aphelion, the Sun Kingdom, and we have some huge things that have progressed over here. You want to talk about uh-huh. it? So we have captured Atlas. He is now being held accountable for his actions of keeping Tyr in his little manacles very poor guy glass like and then Tyr has been released and so kind of have the warders because now that Tyr is taken back over they don't have to listen to atlas so they are able to be a little freer although they are still warders and tied to the whims of the king yes just very much raper like too but anyway yeah right especially when you consider that it's clear that Gabriel and Tyr have a relationship yes. like like in my mind I'm like how much of that is actually a choice I like how it was addressed in this book though because they did bring up the power dynamic and you can't really have an equal relationship consensual both ways type of relationship with that big of a power gap not even just a power gap like there was a power gap between Ryan and his girl but Tyr is directly in control of Gabriel like a boss and a direct report. But then the next scene, we see that Atlas is free again. Like he has escaped his prison and he has killed two of the warders, which we hear should not have been able to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, and he has like spiked them to the wall through their wings. So like not even just killed them, but... Yeah, spiked them and... Yeah, did so in a very disrespectful way. The thing that makes the warders the wings is what he attacked. And so the warders who like we just found out he can kill are now sent to go get him. I wasn't very sure how that was going to work out for the warders because they were sent because he wasn't supposed to be able to kill them, but he just proved that he could. The way I interpreted this whole situation was he used his power of illusion to somehow trick them. And that's why... Four warders were then sent instead of two. It just made it seem like it was harder for him to maintain an illusion the more people were involved. Okay, okay, that but makes more sense. Also able to trick the mirror, right? Yeah. That was what was interesting to me. I was like, I thought these were supposed to be like kind of all seeing, all knowing types of artifacts. But did he really? Or did the mirror know something? Because, spoiler guys, I'm going to go straight to the end. <laughs> because we find out that because of what he did, Tyr was willing to give up his kingdom and become the god, right? Because mm-hmm. he was already so comfortable being alone and he did not feel like he was the king that he should have been. He gave up his kingdom and let the primary rule and he became the god. So did Atlas trick the mirror did the mirror just know that it has to let Atlas do this to tear in order for the future to happen the way it needs to happen I like that thinking let's go with that one it was probably a combination right because there were times where he would just have to throw the cloth over the mirror too or he thought he did because he was in his head thinking I can't trick this mirror and he didn't really need to because the mirror was in on it the whole time because the mirror and the (laughs) coral and the torch and All of the things we find out are the first rulers of the second age that have now went into these artifacts and are like leading still their kingdoms. And so Amara is theoretically in the crown. Herrick theoretically should have been in the torch, but he wasn't because he is not talked about. He just disappeared one day. And so I forgot the like the ruler after him that is actually in the torch. And they're now all seeing, which is why they talked to Lore, because they knew she was going to be a big part of saving Aranos. I don't, I I think that they may have known a little bit more, because they even talked about the Imperium and what the Imperium couldn't do and could do and and things like that. Didn't one even bring her mom to her to tell her a few things? I thought there was a reason behind the mom visit. I think it was when she was going through her talking to all of the artists facts and one of them maybe it was the coral told her some things and then also took her to the evanescence where she got to see her mom and her mom told her some more of her history and that she actually made it to the evanescence with her dad even though they weren't ascended so that Mm -hmm. was sweet Mm -hmm. 
because you're not supposed to be able to make it to the Evanescence unless you're an ascended royal. I like that because that means that they get to see their mom and dad again in the future. That was a little plot thread that I appreciated because you see how important the family was since book one with the three siblings just sticking together in the prison and all the shit that they went through. Although now that I think about this, it's going to be very sad because we we find out that Tristan in the last book or one of the last books that he is the primary of the Woodlands. Mm-hmm. And we know that we have the Heart Queen in lore, but Willow is over here on her own that unless she marries to a primary or a ruler, she isn't going to make it to the Evanescence and see her mom again. I mean, she's going to marry, what's Nadir's sister's name? Amaya? Amaya over at I hope so, but we don't get that happy ending. Like, I know we get <laughs> a happy ending, but we don't find out that they're that. Everybody else is marrying off in like, whatever, but Amaya doesn't. Even Gabriel with Helene. I was happy for him too, because getting over that whole situation with Tyr, I'm sure was very difficult and weird. If I wished for anything, I wished that it had been just a little clearer that Amaya and Willow were still going strong, because yeah. we don't get any confirmation of that. We get their like love story in the last book, but they're kind of like not super close in this book. You know what has been an ongoing funny thread just for like comedic relief throughout the series? And we get it at this book too. Is Apricia being oh, like this spoiled, losing her ever loving shit? <laughs> yes, just having like a petulant child tantrum throwdown in the palace, and her father Cornelius is just like, oh my god, I have to deal with this. I am so glad a she did not become queen, but I also think that that would have been a proper send off for Alice to make him marry her and spend life with her. Like, I think that that would have been more punishment than what he got, which is they found him eventually and he was executed for his crimes against pretty much everybody. (laughs) Hey, Um, remember once upon a time ago when you liked Alice in book one? I do. It was very very short-lived. It was very short-lived, but... This is why I can't like people in the first books. (laughs) I just, I can't because I like them and then I'm like, oh, okay, never mind. Red flag. I am shit at picking men this is why he had that swagger too Mm -hmm. during the whole bachelorette type of thing also okay can we just love on mail for a little bit yeah because i love like he's got the swagger he's got the like snipey comments he says it in like not a mean way like he's always sniping at lore like yeah mm -hmm, that plan didn't work did it (laughs) and stuff like that and then we find out that he was there for nadir when nadir got captured him and etienne and mael was the only one to convince anybody that he didn't have any powers he was like no i'm just a lowly like don't worry about me and then he got them both out Etienne and Nadir out of their chains. I just love him. Mm -hmm. He's like a ride or die, but also he started a ride or die. He didn't need proof from them that they had his back. One thing that we haven't talked about, but is a pretty heavy thing throughout the series that we learn through flashbacks and things like that with Herrick, who is very much like Gollum, is the whole virulence that he's digging and digging and digging deeper for because it will give him power, right? Mm -hmm. Like that was what he was single-mindedly after. It was like a a conduit of power. So it doesn't necessarily give him power, but it strengthens his power if he like like, puts it through. It's kind of like a prism. His whole thing behind that is he's using that to kill Zara. Like that's the only reason he's digging it. Is he he figured out that he can put his power in there and use it against her to kill her. Maybe this is just me. But the whole time they kept destroying arcs and Zara would like pop up and flash and stuff. I started feeling bad for her. Like, I know I should hate her because she's a bitch, but I started feeling bad for her. I was like, man, this is brutal. They're just killing her bit by bit. Well, and you get the like the really detailed vision of her like jerking in pain and stuff too. So I I felt bad for her, but I didn't feel as bad as you probably did because <laughs> what it was it in like Ghostbusters where they like they capture the person and like you get the like scenes of them doing like like pain 
right? So that's what I was envisioning. So I was kind of laughing at her at the same time. I'm like, I know you're in pain, but this is yeah. kind of comical because I felt a I'm little picturing sadistic. this like crazy like ghost person. I think it's like the one with like the crazy hair that I was picturing mm-hmm, in mm-hmm. Ghostbusters. But then there's the one time they let go of the magic and she materializes, right? And she is super powerful, like goes kind of toe to toe with Lore, brings the place down. So she tried to kidnap Nadir again and Lore was not having it. She's like, you're not getting my man. And yeah, they went toe to toe. And (laughs) I think it was during, was it Bronte's or Darcy's breaking of the... Darcy, Darcy's, yep. Because she came back a little bit later to do it after she saw it work for the other. She's like, okay, I guess I'll do it for you. Uh The whole subject of the arcs, whenever Zara releases Lauren's like, go get the arc from the Crystal Palace for me, right? And didn't it kind of remind you of like an Akatar, like a Court of Mist and Fury when Feyre and Rhysand go to the, the summer book. court? Uh-huh. And, yes. and Cyan's just like, if you would have just asked instead of trying to steal my Ark, I might have let you have it. No, he wouldn't have because Lyndon, his his little thruple mate. So him and... Anemone. Anemone. Like, that's a fun word to say. We're kind of in a thruple with Lyndon. Lyndon is wolf so lore's granddad's sister and she blames cersei who i mean realistically is to blame for wolf's death but also wolf is to blame for that too like yes he's a grown-ass man yeah but anyway so she blames cersei and then cersei's kids and grandkids for it like does she not understand that this is wolf's child and grandchild too like does she just like forget that he had any impact on those people being alive and the love that he had for them i mean i guess she wasn't around for that scion had her in his ear so there's no way he would have trusted her with the ark if she would just come in and be like hi can i have maybe I think if Laura would have just taken time to explain like, hey, my mate is like dead right now in limbo with this psycho bitch named Zara. And this is what's happening around the world that he would have stepped up. He was just keeping it in like a tank in the ground, his piece of coral. Who was the one that was like obsessed with the coral and wanted Bane. to talk to it? Bane. What relationship did he, he have? He was Cyan's dad. Okay. <laughs> he like, just never got the power. Who is this? precious little man just scribbling in his notebook (laughs) like with the name bane you expect him to be like burly right like bane and so when i heard the name i was like oh okay this is gonna be like like a badass and then we get this little old man who's just like in love with coral i just i love lore just taking advantage of him she's using every lever that she can pull to try and make this happen. And he just really wanted to know like what Coral would say. And I did I did like, even though she took advantage of him, she knew what his motivations were. I did like that she told him that Coral said he took really good care of her. I liked this because it came full circle to the first book. When Laura was in the chokey hole in the ground being punished at the prison and there were the monsters in the forest and we get the origin story of that. That was heartbreaking to me. Yeah. You texted me about that one. Yeah, what was her name? Lily, I think. Lily, uh huh. This poor low fay. And Ryan made her. He used the virulence to make her into this monster, and then he's like, "Okay, you can go live over there." I just wanted to see if it was possible. Didn't he let her in a room with a bunch of people he didn't like, and she just ended up kind of slaughtering them all in her monster form? Mm -hmm. That was Mm -hmm. dark. Ryan, I had a very difficult relationship with him because you want him to step up and be a better person throughout the series for Nadir and stuff. And then you get his background story, which I get it, man, but you dumb. A push and a pull of his background story, too, because you get scenes with him and Rachel where he absolutely loves Rachel and he's making hard choices for him between his love for Rachel and his power, which he never had to pick between them like i don't know why he had to pick yeah except for he was going for more power so i guess he He just wanted to make her jealous i don't think she was that interested in him i don't think she was as into him as he was into her she was into the money she liked yeah his position so he picked the power and he made or he was trying to make her jealous and got nadir's mom pregnant with him so then he hated nadir's mom and nadir 
And I'm like, you're the one who put your dick in a different woman trying to make her jealous. This is your fault, not theirs. But then you get like, so you get the like good from him a little bit. And then you get that he's just a little bit lost. But then you get these stories of him creating the Uziller Uziller, and things like that. And him like conscripting low fey and not caring if they die and just conscripting scripting them so he doesn't have to worry about their food and water. He's like, hey, you're replaceable kind of thing. And all these other bad things that he does. And it's like, okay, I'm trying to have pity for you that this started with you losing the love of your life, but it's kind of your own fault and you're making some piss poor choices afterwards. So I don't know. Yeah, I ended this book feeling even worse for Nadir and Amaya because... It's almost like they were teased with what could have been with their father when he went down with the whole cave opening or whatever, right? Because they saw that he wasn't a monster. He wasn't, he could feel things and he just, for whatever reason, wouldn't feel things for them. But it was only after he realized that Rachel was a shell of a person, all she could remember was butterscotch, like that one day that they spent together or whatever just being in each other's arms and when he realized that was off the table now and never going to happen only then was he, he able to finally look at his kids well and only then was he able to admit that he could have probably had some peace and some happiness in his life yeah. if he had just gotten over the i was forced into this but isn't that how it be with mm-hmm. people like th- th- especially the ones that just focus on the past and what could have been and don't just focus mm-hmm. on Making or the negative now yeah like focus yeah. on the negative and uh-huh. not just like Stop okay living well, in there's the past. a bad bad shit happened uh-huh. i can either dwell on that or i can look forward to some good shit happening mm-hmm. but was amaya wasn't there during that it was lore and nadir who saw him like he he took the ark away from herrick and helped them escape and then Amaya and Nadir had went to his mom and she f- yeah. that's who they figured out that Amaya could have had a better relationship with her if they had just tried to build it. Poor Amaya has shit parents. At least Nadir remembered some of the good times with his mom before she just yeah. kind of closed off. At least she had Nadir though. Another satisfying thing that we got to see in this book was Cloris Payne get burned alive. I thought you were about to say all the sex. No, I mean that was... <laughs> There was a lot of sex. I would yes. give this like four this a spicy book. Four spicy peppers. There were a lot of open and it was door very scenes. descriptive. <laughs> That's one way to put it. Mm-hmm. Very descriptive. So if you like descriptive sex scenes, you get a full picture of what's happening with this. Full picture. It's like a very full Monty. generous. Yes. Uh huh. His and her perspective. But yes, Cloris Payne dying. I loved that Gabe at the end made her house or like the the house of pain or whatever it was called. House of pain. A rose garden as kind of like, I, I envisioned this as a tribute to lore and the person <laughs> who caused her so much pain, pun intended, being done. And it's I don't know something. why, but when he was talking about all the, you know, options that that place was going to become after Cloris Payne pa- passed. For some reason, I just kept thinking back to like old Gabriel. And I was like, what if he turned it into like an S&M brothel type of place? I did too. That's I'm like, it's thinking. totally going to be a brothel. <laughs> but then he's like, and no, it- it's going to be a rose garden. I'm like, oh, okay. That's pretty with lightning bugs. <laughs> mm-hmm. I- and then um, Marcy... And Halo are now the caretakers of it. And Gabe was like, I'll pay somebody to do it. And they're like, no, no, you got it. <laughs> Sit down. <laughs> but, um, but they didn't really need the money because another thing that happened is Tyr, before he became the god, kind of stripped a couple of things out of history before he got rid of the art too. And he, or was it Erevin? Somebody made it to where all of the, I think it was Tyr, all of the warders wasn't a thing anymore. Like he broke the spell or the whatever. Tyr the did warders. that. Mm-hmm. And then he also made it to where like the sun trials, sun queen trials went away. Like they were no longer a thing. And that all of the past people who were involved in them were rewarded with wealth. And so Marcy and Halo didn't need to do anything. And even Apricia, who just had a little meltdown about being kicked out of the palace and she was supposed to be king, queen, sorry, (laughs) 
queen and got her wealth from it. But you know what? Even she grew up too. I was like, whatever you did, Cornelius, to help your daughter, it worked. Because then she was doing the work with the orphanages and, you know, trying to do that stuff and opening those up. I was like, oh, good for you. You do care about other people that are not yourself. Oh, and they shut down the prison. Yep. Nostraza. Speaking of sex scenes, we had a lot of strife in this book. Like there's a whole scene in the underworld where they're having to do like this very much Hunger Games-like challenge to get out. And even that, you know Herrick isn't going to let them out the whole time. Mm -hmm. But somehow they think he is. So they're doing that. And it was, to me, it was very much Hunger Games-like. There was bears, there was quicksand there was like all kinds of things that were supposed to kill them and i hated the bear scene because they're just sitting here stabbing multiple bears over and over and over i was gonna and say i must have I, blocked that out because you texted me i don't like this bears stuff and i was like what the hell is she talking about i don't, I don't like remember. them attacking the little animals okay i blocked that out then <laughs> and i was also very worried about the dogs yes the I love little the dogs i'm like please tell me one of the dogs doesn't die because i'm i'm like I can't handle that. I'm, I'm going to go John Wick. Can't. Kill my puppy. Don't kill yeah. the puppies. Don't kill the little animals. They don't know what they're doing. But how big were these dogs? Didn't they ride them out? Yes, they were. Then, okay. like, they must have been like dire wolves or something. Yes, they were huge, apparently. I was happy that the dogs survived. I was not as happy that they had to kill a bunch of bears. And then it just kind of ends. And then they kill Herrick, which they could have done before this even happened. Wait, I thought he was alive by the end of it. He was, but then they kill him. Wait. Or will they like they like bring down the underworld on top of him? He's trapped in there. Like he yeah. can't come out, but he's still alive. Yeah. Like he's Lord of the Underworld. In what world do you think this is gonna be okay? Um, which I'm wearing my Hercules like shirt, and he did remind me a lot of Hades with his shady, like taking the girl down. <laughs> and and Ryan was like the Hercules going down to get his girl into the underworld. Less heroic, though. Yes, your shirt is very fitting for this episode. So we end that. We go back up. We see everything settling down in Ophelia. Cedar has invited Tristan to come stay with him for a little bit and learn about the woodlands. I love Tristan. Like, he's a good brother. He made a lot of sacrifices, and he finally gets to learn how to be happy. But he he left his Nazarene or whatever behind an Ophelia. And I'm like, oh, or Ophelion, whatever that is. He left who? Nazarene. Like, his little girlfriend that he got. I don't remember this girlfriend. Yeah, he was getting close to this girl, and there was a lot of, like, cute little, like, scenes. And he's like, I don't, I don't think I'm ready for a real relationship yet but it was adorable so he is also getting his his life back together and there was even one one really funny scene where they were talking about Nazarin and he's like I'm just not ready because of all the things that happened and they're like well you did find some comfort in Nostraza and they mentioned a girl I think her name was Sophia and he's like oh yeah Sophia taught me things and they're like she's like older (laughs) yeah and the sister's like, okay, sorry, we brought this up. Okay, we don't need to know the details. She was older. She was like 30 or something like that. 32. Mm-hmm. She, she like taught 18. him some things. Mm, that's why he's so charming now. Who gave Lore the soap at the end? That was Tristan and Willow. They gave her it for her like bonding ceremony. I loved it because it or goes the, back the, to- Her ascension. It goes back to- that bitch stole my soap, like the opening line of the book, uh-huh. like the first book or something. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it's an inside joke just between them because nobody else knows what the fuck the soap means. And they're yeah. all like, what? It meant everything. Are you giving her soap? And then she ascends and you can see the like land of heart coming back alive and the magic coming back to the people and stuff, which I love. Mm -hmm. They mercy killed all of the Osler. So that was good, at least. They reminded me Mm -hmm. of the the Shadowfold creatures in uh, Shadow and Bone because they Mm -hmm. were all people that were living in those lands when the Shadowfold took over. I like that everything got a conclusion and that you're not really left with any questions. You know, what was so funny to me in this book was the fact that Gabriel could not remember Tristan's name and kept like internally thinking like Thomas, Tyler, Timothy, what's his name, Trevor? He's like every other teenager. All teenagers. Tristan. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. 
I did like that. I did like how Tristan finally came to understand that Nadir was very much in love with his sister mm-hmm. and would do anything. And then they became like brothers is what Nadir said. He, he got a second brother. I loved that because Tristan is very protective of Lore and him recognizing that Nadir is also just as protective yeah. was great. I was glad that Nadir and his sister were kind of going to be absorbed into this greater like Woodlands family mm-hmm. because Lore and Nadir both just had no luck and not a good time all their life with all their parents' situation, all of that. And so now they get to be a part of the big happy Woodlands family. Yeah. And I I like that Nadir got pulled in because he was willing to make the sacrifice of his kingdom for her. Very stark difference from his father. Yeah. And then he told the torch, he's like, because the torch is like, well, we're going to need somebody else. And he's like, Amaya, she should have been it from the beginning. Which I like that because every time Amaya was described, even in the first book, they're talking about her hair and her skirts looking like the color of the Aurora constant. Like she was the living embodiment of the Aurora the whole time. Loved her. Yeah. So I like that. I like that he stood up for his sister in the end too. Mm-hmm. But he he made sure she wanted it before he did it. Consent was a huge theme throughout this book with all of the relationships and power Except for Ryan handoffs. He, and Sarah. Except for they him. Did, that was what not, not to do. have consent. <laughs> what not to do. <laughs> Bad things happen to people who don't get consent. Mm-hmm, they get mm-hmm. ghost busted, killed with little prisons. So if you like... Family drama wrapping up and consent and found forgiveness, found family, lots of spicy scenes sprinkled in even then when things are looking quite dire. And not a damsel in distress. Definitely not. I mean, she kind of is in distress, but she is a hero in distress. Any last words about Tale of the Heart Queen by Nisha Tooley? It is a long ride. It's a long ride. There are a lot of things to wrap up, right? Uh I feel like any time a book gives you so many POV characters, all of those need to have a satisfying conclusion, right? And I feel like Uh that's one of the main drivers behind this being such a chonker of a book. Yeah. Well, and like I like I said, I do like that we got our happy endings and full closure on everybody except for Maya. I would have liked a little bit more full closure on Maya and Willow. And did they bond, right? Mm-hmm. Are they still together? Are they on their way to bonding? Is that even a thing? Can they bond? Because mm-hmm. their siblings are bonded. I don't know. I want Hell Willow to be work. able to see her parents and ascend so that she can see her parents in the evanescence. So Yeah. I want to know. I'm just going to I'm just going to pretend that that did happen. So for my sake. Well, you know, if the new Zara Tyr has any say in it, I feel like he would let those things happen, right? Cuz doesn't he kind of orchestrate the whole Evanescence area? Well, I know the Evanescence is around him, but Zara couldn't get into it. It was just around her. But did she try or did she just stay in her little play? I don't know, playground? but they they like her parents said that she hasn't been in here and so did Nadir's grandpa because Nadir went there escaping Zara and he was worried and his grandpa's like you're fine it's fine that was a good scene I forgot Uh about that one and then I like that they had to sacrifice something to get out of Zara's like place and what Nadir sacrificed to himself basically and what Lore accidentally sacrificed was she thought that he was lost to her forever. And so when she came to grips with losing him forever, that's when she was able to get out because she basically sacrificed him. Poor Nadir is just getting sacrificed for everybody to get out of Sarah's control. Hey, Tara likes a sacrificial lamb. <laughs> yeah. He was willing, right? Yeah. Consent. Yeah. He, he consented yeah. to being sacrificed. Everybody gets a happy ever after. And that concludes Artifacts of Uranos. We hope you enjoyed our discussion of Tale of the Heart Queen by Nisha J. Tooley. Let us know what you think of the book. What's next week? What are we talking about next week? Monsoon Rising, isn't it? Yes. We've and then the Happy arc. New Year. Yeah. And we'll see you Bye. next year. Bye. <laughs>